I can see it. Okay, good deal. Sometimes this guy likes to go on a pause, so just making sure. Um, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about gardening and storage. This cracked me up, so, you know, this is, <laughs> we sure hope our gardening works, right? For me, it's tomatoes. For these guys, it's wine corks. You know, you want it to grow. Anyway, so it's the season, right, for this. I'm going to sort of walk through a few things according to the timing. Well, why don't y'all turn off the light? Y'all will be easier to, it'll be easier for y'all to see that. Um, I'm going to walk through, oh, I forgot. Now y'all can't see me. <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway, that doesn't matter. Y'all are just looking at the screen anyhow. Um, so we're going to walk through it according to the approximate time that it's coming due. And what's coming due right now are onions. Um, so I always get questions about onions every year. Um, some people don't realize you can actually pick them and eat them at any stage uh, when they're, you can thin your slips when you plant your slips and eat those as green onions or as bunching onions. Um, one thing you do know and can know for sure that they've gotten as big as they're going to get when the green tops lay over. Uh, once the tops have laid over, those bulbs aren't getting any bigger. Um, if the bulbs bolt, which means if they make that flower at the top, they're not going to get any bigger after that either. And because the plant has now shifted into making seeds, um, they are not going to, uh, it's not going to get bigger and the fruit is that the bulb is actually going to deteriorate. Uh, so you want to harvest that. If you see it making a flower, harvest that and go ahead and eat it or process it immediately. Um, it won't last in the ground and it won't last in dried storage like you would normally store a different onion. Is that, uh, is that a, a characteristic of that flower head that you can't, you've got to eat it, you can't, you can't store it dry? The reason, the re that's a good question, Craig. And the reason that it does that is because it's the hormonal shift inside the plant. And instead of having the bulb grow to be plump and juicy, all, literally all of that energy starts being funneled to make the seeds. So that's why you get deterioration of the bulb there. Okay. Um, spring, our spring temperature swings are what cause that bolting. Uh, and it seems to be the bigger the slips you plant, the more likely they are to bolt for you. Um, let me. We sure had the um, temperature swing the last couple of days. Woo, yes. It went from, wow, this is kind of nice to, oh my goodness, this is hell's back uh, Anyway, it should be an interesting summer. Uh, so for storage, you know, so we're talking about when to harvest, uh, talking a little bit about storage. Uh, when you want to store them dried, you want to start with completely mature onions, like the tops laid over, okay, and you want to pull them up and you want to let them dry whole for at least two days, okay? So it's part of the curing process. You need that outer layer to get papery on there. So you're going to um, stop that, you're going to start that curing process by pulling them up. You can lay them over in the field if you want to. Um, but you want to give it two days of pulling up, uh, and then, at, um, and then after that, um, you want to cut the greens off. You want to leave about a one inch stem on there, three quarters to an inch, and then you let it dry a little more, okay, at least another two days, and then you want to store it in a place that's well ventilated. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you say dry, what temperature are we drying in? If it's left in the field, it can be pretty hot. It can. So, but the important thing is the moisture content. If it was, was going to be wet in the field, you would not want to. Um, you would not want to leave it lay in the field. So you put them out to dry in the sun. That for a couple of days. Yeah, you can do that. Um, you can leave them air dry in the sun. That's frequently what's done in the field. They'll just 
pick them, you know, pull them over um, because that they're on nice, good, sandy soil. But you don't want to do that and have them lay in water because the whole point of curing them is for that outer layer to dry off. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. So ventilation is important because we know what happens when we don't have good ventilation, right? We get gross things growing. Um, so you want to make sure. Uh, that was one of the Gwen's onions about mm, two weeks ago or something. Looking mighty tasty to me. Um, okay. So now my little dealie won't work. Why are you doing that? Potatoes. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about potatoes because that's the next thing that comes up pretty much at the same time or next door to the onions, thereabouts. How do you know when your potatoes are ready to harvest? The tops begin to turn yellow. Okay. That can be anywhere from 75 days to 140 days from the time you transplant it. It depends on what variety you're growing and the weather and all kinds of things. Um, so, you know, if, if the tops start turning yellow, you're not going to get any more growth out of them. So basically, wherever they are is wherever they are with that. Um, you can make them harden off. If you're ready to harvest your potatoes, you can cut the tops off and then the potatoes underground will start to form a firmer skin. And then you'll, you'll get that maturity. You know, it's like, a, you know, pruning the tops causes the bottoms, you know, the potatoes to get ready to harvest. Um, you want to, when you're harvesting potatoes, you don't want that skin on there slipping a lot right? Um, the recommendation is if the skin is slipping a lot, you need to wait a couple of days. Um, they'll store longer if you wait to harvest them, okay? Once you harvest them, so we're out there, we're in the heat, we're in the ants, you dig them up, okay? After you harvest them, you're going to have, you're going to want them to cure about 10 days, and um, that's going to be in about 65 degrees. So we're not going to put that out in the heat of the, but that's a sort of inside room temperature uh, ish, you know, and, but it needs to be high humidity. So you're doing that to do that. You're, you're shifting the starches on the inside. You're changing the plant hormonal production. So the end flavor will be better when you let them cure okay once they're cured then you need to store them in a colder environment okay go ahead and save a few for your swing your spring harvest now i know that we have all had that opportunity where we've had our potatoes and they tasted sweet right that's because they when they go into that cool temperature the starches switch to sugars Okay, and so if you take it directly from your refrigerator drawer and cook it, then it's going to have that sweet flavor. But if you let it spend a couple of days going back up at 65 or higher, you're going to get that sweet flavor back and off. You'll get it good back to that starchy taste. So, because, I, always, you know, that's a thing now. It seems to be that the longer things sit and harvest, the more the flavor gets strange. But if you can let it get back up to room temperature for a couple of days to flip those starches over, um, you'll be good to go. Oh, I just wanna restate in, this, in the chat box on screen for you guys online on Zoom, I did provide the link to this uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so hopefully you guys will click on that uh, and have access to that. Obviously, you can let me know if you didn't get it. Well, we can talk about it. Okay, so. Your crisper door, that's your refrigerator. For us here in East Texas, that has to be in a refrigerator. There is nothing in my, in up and up north, you might be able to get this kind of a cool temper, temperature in the basement, you know, yeah. in a cold storage. Here, it's going to have to be in a refrigerator. Uh, so if you got 30 pounds, 40 pounds of potatoes, then you just get enough to refrigerate. <laughs> yeah, it's, or you look at freezing, 
you know, because you can freeze them for soups and stews. They won't hold their texture after they're frozen, but they're still usable, right? So you couldn't use them for scallop potatoes, but you could use them for soups and stews and stuff. Um, so you can freeze them, you can can them. Um, but so yeah, uh, to get it to hold for a while in cooler temperatures, you know, you could leave them in the ground, but we just, our ground just gets too hot for that. So they'll just rot. All right, English peas, um, which is one of my favorite garden vegetables. And we are pretty much past our window. We're past our window for planting that, okay? So if you wanted them and you didn't, get them yet, I'm sorry, this is not your year, but at least this isn't your spring because you can plant them again this fall. You can plant them in August to September where the main growth is as the heat turns off. Okay, so some of them are grown for their pods like snow peas. Uh, those come flat and sweet. That's the stuff that's in your um, stir fry if you're making um, Chinese food or something. <laughs> Uh, Mongolian or whatever, that's going to be those flat pods, snow peas. Okay, sugar snap peas are the round pods. Okay, uh, some are grown for uh, the garden peas or the English peas that are maturing inside the pod. Okay, this is a cool season crop. Uh, they cannot handle our summer temperatures whatsoever. Um, when we move into our warm season, that's when we start planting our field peas and stuff like that. But English peas can be delicious for us. Yeah, so there are some varieties that grow really well for us. You never want to try to do this as a transplant. Uh, these guys are going to grow best from seed. Uh, those legume roots do not like to be disturbed. Uh, the good news is it's easy to save seed and uh, easy to grow it back from seed. Uh, I will say this. You want to go by the days to harvest that's on your package. Uh, that's uh, because some of them are short harvest season, especially if you're going for a snow pea with that flat pod, that's going to be some of them are 50 days, but some of them are longer when you're growing it for that field pea. Um, this is something that I thought was interesting that I hadn't really thought about. The pea vines are actually edible. Those tender shoot tips are apparently very tasty. Now, I've not tried that. But I guarantee you, I've got a neighbor that's growing English peas. <laughs> and I may try it. <laughs> but um, so that's that's a fun thing to know about that. Those tender shoots would be fun to add to your pea pot. Um, so for to, to know when to harvest those snow peas, the ones that you want to eat flat, um, you want it, you're looking to match the pod length right? That's when you know those are mature. You need to know what variety you're growing, because if you're growing something like, uh, what's that one called? Little Wonder or whatever, that's a small pod. That's got a really short pod. Um, so, you know, if you keep waiting to get this big long thing, it's going to turn really fibrous and gross and not very edible. Um, so you want to, those are very thin and barely a trace of that pea can be seen inside. If you let it mature too much, uh, it's not going to be a good, pleasant eating experience. And you also lose the sweetness. It becomes rabbit food. So. Exactly. So the funny thing with peas is, of course, if you harvest them too soon, they're not as sweet as they could be. And if you harvest them too late, they're not as sweet as they could be. <laughs> they've got, they have like got they like it how they like it. Um, sugar snap peas, and there is actually a variety literally called sugar snap. Uh, but there are also several others. Um, so you want to harvest those when the pods are nearly full, um, when they're nice, good, plump, and tender. Um, if you are, again, if you pick too early, they're not going to be as sweet. And if you pick too late, they're going to turn starchy on the inside. Now, these sugar snaps are where you're going to eat them in the pod, basically the same way we would a snap bean. Um, you know, you're eating that immature. So the pod is going to be sweet and succulent, but the fruit inside those peas are also going to be sweet and succulent. If you want to save these seed, which I highly recommend, uh, these are open pollinated, almost all, I mean, all of them. Um, you just want those to stay on the vine until they're rattled dry. 
And even when you can rattle that and it's dry, you still need to, when you harvest that, you can shell it and still let them dry some more, or you can set the pod to the side and still let it dry some more. But the important thing is that it be as dry as possible when you put that up uh, for harvest. And uh, something else, just as a PS, sweet peas are something else entirely. Lots of people call English peas or garden peas sweet peas because they're sweet. They have a sweeter flavor, but they're really not. Sweet peas are something else entirely. They're grown for the flower and they are not edible. So interesting aside there. Okay, corn. That's going to be coming up. Hopefully y'all's corn is growing well. Uh, nice and green. Don't forget, this isn't really what we're talking about today, but corn is a very heavy feeder. So if you're growing it, make sure it's got a good nitrogen source. Okay, so how do you know when your corn is ready? Your corn is ready when those silks are dry and brown. Okay, the silks, that's why I included the, the thing on the side where you can see all the parts. Uh, the silks are on the ear. That's what's going to dry up. Those are actually like the pollen tubes. Uh, from germinating the kernels. So that's pretty cool. Um, the tassels are the male parts of the flower. Uh, that's where the pollen comes from. Corn is wind pollinated, so you, it's better to grow it in a bunch uh, instead of those long rows, unless you've got a lot of long rows. Uh, but you'll have much better pollination if you plant in squares or rectangles instead of long straight rows. Can you still uh, grow corn now? I mean, could you put mm -hmm. it in a, in a uh, wheat tub, for instance? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, as long as you're feeding it and you get water, you sure can. Okay. Um, so if you're growing sweet corn, it, <clears throat> if you're growing sweet corn, you want to harvest that at what they call the milk stage. And that literally means when you stick your thumbnail into that kernel, it needs to give you a, a milky, a, a whitish juice out of there. And not if it's clear, it's too early. And if it doesn't give you any juice, it's too late <laughs> because, because it gets really doughy and starchy uh, when it's too old. So uh, you got to hate that. Uh, but anyway, so as far as how to harvest, now you guys have all harvested corn. Most of y'all, but uh, if you haven't, just understand you're going to harvest that by pushing down and twisting. Usually, not every ear of corn is harvested at, is um, harvested at the same time because they're not usually ripe. But it does uh, ripe all at the same time. But it does depend on what variety you're growing. So this is where it's important to know what you've got going on there. Um, corn is one of those that uh, the maturity can depend on the weather. So sure, it's important to know days to harvest, but once those silks turn brown and dry up, it doesn't, that is, uh, if for sweet corn, you do, that's it. Um, now, if you're growing for dent corn or grinding corn, you can just leave those right on there um, and do that. The caution for that is, uh, for some varieties, you can lose it off the cob if it dries out more than say, you know, where there's only 25% moisture total left in that cob, you'll lose some of your kernels when you harvest. But um, anyway, that's a, that's a fun thing about the, the corns that are not sweet corn is you can basically leave those on there. That includes popcorn and grinding corn and all of that. Now, something to make note of, sweet corn loses its sweetness in a big hurry. Um, if it stays hot for very long after you take it out, it will start to immediately lose its sugar content. Um, as much as 50% within that first, within 12 hours, if it's not refrigerated. So it's important to refrigerate your corn. Just how, how soon does uh, that corn get harvested? 12 hours? I mean, I'm thinking it's, that's not what you're going to find in the store. That's because true. That, I mean, in general, but also with some of the combines, they have, um, and we'll talk about that at the end, they have some ways to go through and chill things immediately to get the field heat out of it. Right. So um, they, they can do that. 
in some particular ways to, uh, to help the flavor along. Okay, so the thing to know about storing your corn, obviously it's gonna need to be refrigerated. Okay, if you're eating, if you're eating corn, it's your sweet corn, you're gonna need to refrigerate it. If this is dried corn for other purposes, just remember that lots of animals like dried corn, not just like everything, mice, rats, the whole nine yards. So wherever you're storing that, it's gonna need to be, uh, you know, solidly, solidly sealed. Grain beetles, oh my goodness. Um, and also, if you're trying to store a lot of corn, um, this is something we don't talk about much here in East Texas because corn storage is not a big deal. But on a larger scale, that dust that dried corn makes, that dust is flammable. And so um, if you're going to store a large quantity of that, just be aware, do some research on that. Okay. Um, so anyway. The seeds themselves, if you're trying to save, uh, as, unless you're buying some hybrid sweet corns, most all of it, you can save your own seeds. Um, that seed life is going to be really short lived. So corn seed is only going to be good for usually a maximum of two years. You're going to lose a lot of viability um, and germination as it goes down. Um, if you are saving seeds, I want you to definitely be sure and save seeds from multiple ears for multiple stalks of corn. Don't just pick one stalk of corn and say, I like the way this stalk looks and only save the seed from that. I mean, you can do that, but the genetics on corn degrade pretty quickly generationally with the seed saving. So the more you spread that genetics out, the better long-term, the longer you can keep your genetics in place for your corn. Do you have to, to uh, save the, the, the seeds uh, from one stalk in a bag by itself? No. And then you can mix all of You can mix it all up. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, unless you just wanted to, but for the purpose of your next year's harvest, you would mix all that together so that, so that you were getting the genetics mix, the good genetic mix there. All right, summer squash. I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so the good news about summer squash is that you can harvest it just as big or as little as you want to. You can harvest it when it's still a bloom. Um, squash blossoms are good. You can eat them raw in a salad or stuff them. You can fry them. Um, you can put them in omelets. We've eaten them a couple of different ways at Caddo Mounds. Um, so anyway, it's good fun. Uh, so, but I'm not going to eat any of those blooms until I'm heartily sick of squash, which hasn't happened in a long, long time. Uh, so squash is currently my uh, favorite garden vegetable, squash and tomatoes. But anyway, so you do want to harvest before it gets too, too big. Uh, of course, we can, we all miss that one zucchini that turns into a baseball bat, you know, but when you see it, go ahead and pull it off. Even if you're not going to bring it into the house or whatever, go ahead and pull it off because then it'll quit drawing resources from that plant. Because when it's growing that one big monster, it quits putting out so many new blooms and everything. So you want to take that monster off of there. Now, the one thing I will say about that is if you are going to save seed, you can leave that monster on if that's the monster you want to save seed from. But okay. basically, you're going to lose the yield from that plant. I got a question on which is the best way to harvest your squash by twisting it off or by cutting it off? Okay, so the fail safe way to harvest it is by cutting it off. Okay. Um, that way you're not going to get broken necks and you're not going to accidentally pull up your squash plant. However, I mean, that would be a case of do as you say, not as, not as, you know, do as I say, not as I do, because uh, I definitely do not use any kind of cutting implement to harvest my squash. I'm a snap it off girl. I grew up doing it that way. I snap it off, but do the necks sometimes break? Yes. And have I occasionally sacrificed a plant? My, well, my question uh, based around which is better for the plant. It's better for the plant to cut it. 
Okay. Because it reduces the stress on the plant. It's better for the plant to get it. Okay. Um, and we'll get on to winter squash in the next slide. But um, so um, now when you get up there and your squash is producing, you're looking at harvesting like every other day. That's uh, the general to keep the size a good edible size. If your squash is producing well, you're gathering about every other day. Okay, if you want to uh, to store it, it needs to be in a cool, humid place. Your crisper drawer is a good place for this. They will not sit very well. They will sit outside the fridge for a little bit, but the rot sets in very quickly like that. So. Um, you're going to want to process, if you can't refrigerate it, you're going to want to process it, you know, and take care of it as, you know, with some timely, uh, in, with some alacrity. Can you, can you freeze it? Absolutely. The thing about freezing squash, um, you can freeze it and it will cook and taste just fine, but it, the, the texture does not hold up. Yes. It's so watery. So you get, that becomes a soup and stew squash. Um, it will not hold up. Uh, you could, yeah, you can bake it in casserole. It's excellent for squash casserole, but you won't be sauteing it. Or frying it. Yeah, or frying it. Um, okay, so if you are going to save seed, be aware all the squash, if you grow like patty pan and summer squash and zucchini and all of that together, all of that is going to mix. Okay, that'll turn into a, what is that if you say the seed next year? Because they have to be like half a mile apart. Now there are, if you're growing like pumpkins and summer squash and, and winter squash, in general, those, you know, do some research of what you want to grow, but you can grow Pipo, Maximum, Mushata, and Mixta types and those generally will not interbreed, it's rare. But if you're gonna try to grow two different pumpkins or you know, some of those big storing squashes, you know, that sort of thing, that's, that stuff will mix. So you've got to watch for that. It's, a, it's good to do a little research. If you are trying to grow two different summer squashes at one time and you wanna save seed from those, the safe distance for that, if you're just going by distance, is half a mile. <laughs> or, or you can hand pollinate, which is really easy with squash and melons and anything with those big blooms. And basically, as you see the female, as you see that female flower starting to open, you put like a bag over it or, you know, you're, you're, you, some people will bind the petals closed. And then they'll get, you know, when it's, they'll go get the male um, pollen and paint it with a Q-tip or whatever on the female flower, close it back up and, you know, do it that way. And that way they're saving seeds. So there's lots of information about doing that on the net. So it's possible you just need to be diligent and mark that bloom so that, you know, that's the squash you're saving. So. It's an interesting thought that way, but it works. It works. I know somebody who does that for watermelons and squash and all kinds of things. So, okay, winter squash. Um, and the reason I put this up there, we're not harvesting this until later in the season, but we, I get this question a lot. So I'm going to talk about it here when we're talking about summer squash. With winter squash, it's going to do better if you leave it on the vine until, like the, very, until the first frost. Just leave it on the vine and let it uh, let it do that. Um, you want it to be fully mature when you harvest because if you don't, it's gonna it's not gonna do the storing thing that it needs to do. It needs to uh, it needs to be hard enough on the outside that it really can't be punctured with a with a thumbnail. Okay. Also, the appearance gets really dull looking. You get a matte appearance. Okay. You want to try to avoid bruising them while you're harvesting them because all those bruises turn into rot spots in a hurry, okay? You want to cut them off with pruning shears and you want to leave a one inch stem on each fruit, okay? Now, once you harvest that, uh, with the exception of acorns, you want to cure all of the other winter squash. 
they're going to need to uh, cure for several days at a pretty high temperature, which is fine for us. It can be on the porch uh, and a pretty high humidity, which also naturally happens for us. Okay, uh, you do not cure acorn squash. Uh, the acorn squash uh, can, needs to go directly into a cool, dry, well-ventilated location. They don't need that curing period. Okay, they need to be stored at about 50 to 55. Um, you know, how you want to manage that, I don't know. It doesn't necessarily, like nobody's, they're not sitting around there with a thermometer. This is just best practices for this. So will they store like that? Um, what did she call it? That sweet potato, That's the, that sweet potato squash. And I forget, but it's like Carolina sweet potato or whatever, but it's a squash. But obviously that's storing here. She's not refrigerating that. She's, you know, keeping it in her living room. So that's, you know, going to be about 70 degrees. All right. So you don't want to store your squash near apples or pears or bananas or any other ripening fruit uh, because that will shorten the storage life of those winter squash. The whole purpose of growing winter squash is to store them. Um, most of them will store for uh, five to six months and that sort of thing. So you can get some good storage out of them. That's the whole purpose of winter squash is to have squash to eat long-term. Okay, Norton says that's uh, Tennessee. Yeah, Tennessee sweet potato? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dorothy. I appreciate that. I, just, I knew it was one of those states. <laughs> okay, so moving on to tomatoes. Hopefully they'll be ripe soon. I can't wait. Okay. You can pick tomatoes, they will ripen indoors um, once any kind of a color flush has started to happen on the bottom end. That's called breaking, once the color is breaking. Um, and they'll, they'll continue that. And as a matter of fact, I mean, that's how they're picked in the grocery store. The tomato itself starts to create a layer that seals off um, the nutrient and water flow to the tomato once it starts to turn color. So you get um, a slowdown in that exchange of fluids there. Um, it will continue to ripen inside the house that way. Um, so can you leave it on the vine? Yes, but I'll tell you who likes tomatoes even more than we do, everything, birds and squirrels and every other thing. So, uh, you know, I, I know, we're like, oh, you, you want to harvest them a little bit? Well, I can guarantee you, if you're like, I'm just going to leave it one more day so I can pick it perfectly vine ripe, <laughs> something else will have already eaten. I assure you, it will be gone or mauled. Okay, so this is, so it's kind of a, um, a mistaken thought. People think that when they harvest tomatoes, they should put them in the sun to ripen. And that is not true. Okay, you need to have that tomato that's already, it's already harvested. You need to have that out of the sun. Um, and I mean, protected from the sun. So it doesn't, we're not talking cool like a refrigerator, but it needs to be coolish and dry with some, uh, some airflow there. Okay, you do not want to place those ripening tomatoes uh, directly in sunlight because what that will do is cause that rot. You get, um, a great decrease in your storage survival that way. So you want to let your underripe tomatoes ripen. So you don't want to, you can refrigerate tomatoes if, if you refrigerate them at peak ripeness, right? And the key to having a refrigerated tomato taste good is when you bring it out of the refrigerator, let it come back to room temperature. And that's where you get the taste return on that. And that's something that a lot of people don't do um, is let it return to room temperature before you eat it. Um, because cold, that's why cold tomatoes just are, the flavor is not there. Uh, so, you know, if you pick go, pick, go out and pick a ripe tomato or buy ripe tomatoes from the farmer's market or something, you can refrigerate those. But before you eat them, you want to let them come to room temperature. Okay. Only save seed from open pollinated fruit. Um, so that from, from your open pollinated varieties, because 
anything that's a hybrid is not going to give you what you want. That's a lot of trouble to go to to not get what you want. And there are plenty of open pollinated varieties. But there is no point in saving seed from a grocery store tomato. Zero. Um, so if you're choosing fruit to, um, to save seed from, you don't want to choose the very first fruit, okay? You want to let, let that fruit, whichever one you choose, you don't want it to be the first one, and really you don't want it to be the very last one either. You want to pick good quality fruit in the middle, and you let it ripen fully on the vine, and then you can go through the seed saving process. Okay, again, the seeds need to be stored cool and dry on that one. And we'll talk a little bit more about seeds as we get as we get a little closer to the end. Um, but tomatoes, you know, that's always the big thing is should we store them on the counter? Should we store them inside? Uh, so we're warm enough that if at peak ripeness we don't refrigerate them, we're going to have a shortened lifespan on them, which is fine if you're canning. But if you've got a lot of tomatoes that you want to hold, uh, when they're at peak ripeness, just stick them in the fridge. Uh, so anyway, some people are like, he gads, that's horrible. It's, it's okay, we can do it. Um, okay, let's talk about peppers. This is another one of those that you really, really, really need to use snips or something to harvest, okay? Because you can do a lot of damage to your pepper plant if you're not careful about how you harvest, okay? This is another one where you can harvest at multiple levels of ripeness and use them. Um, unlike tomatoes, you really want to, you're gonna harvest it whenever, but it needs to ripen before you use it. Peppers can be used, okay? Um, you know, uh, jalapeno peppers we harvest when they're that nice sort of black green, but they can also go all the way to bright red. Uh, so that's the more ripe peppers are, the sweeter they have, uh, the more kind of full their flavor gets. Um, so bell peppers, of course, red bell peppers just means they're fully ripe, you know. Um, orange and yellow or stops along the way for that. Peppers do generally have a long growing season. If you're trying to grow ghost peppers or Carolina reapers or any of those scorpion peppers, those take a long time. The bushes, the seeds take a long time to germinate. The bushes take a long time to grow. Like it'll be, sometimes it's two or three months before it even produces a bloom. Okay. And then, and then once you've got that bloom on there, you're gonna, that's gonna be another 120 days to harvest. So those uh, hot peppers can take you a while. So if you wanna grow that really hot stuff, start that way on up in the, uh, in the season. Uh, chili peppers. Uh, what do you mean as far as how long do they take? Yeah. There are different varieties, but chili peppers and bell peppers and all that are going to be the same awesome. basic. That's going to be all about the same basics. But again, with peppers um, on your uh, insert for that, it's going to have a days to harvest. And that's days from when you plant your transplant to when your fruit should be ready. So it's going to be a good target for that. Okay. Again, you can save seed from peppers. Um, they definitely can uh, cross. Uh, some of the peppers can definitely cross. They won't cross with tomatoes or anything like that. Um, we have yet to scientifically prove ever that peppers, growing peppers and tomatoes next door to each other will make your tomatoes hot. Um, I've heard that said, but scientifically it has not ever been proven to be true. Now, so if you do want to save seed, again, you want to let it fully ripen on the vine uh, to save seed from that. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about some things that are issues while we harvest. Field heat is kind of a big deal for us, okay? Our temperatures are getting hot, and field heat is that heat that's contained in the crop immediately after harvest. It's basically like the sunshine is still doing its work in that crop harvest, okay? And that can absolutely affect um, your storage and all of that. So because of that, you wanna pick in the morning 
Okay, the morning hours are gonna be cooler for that. And so you wanna pick before you've got that super hot field heat built up in there. And also you can submerge it in water uh, right there to bring the heat out of it as long as the food, food, whatever you're harvesting can be dried before storage. For almost everything, the recommendation is not to wash it until you're gonna eat it. Um, because of course, washing it is that opportunity for fungus and stuff like that. But um, in some cases, getting rid of the field heat is important. Maybe you can't pick until two o'clock in the afternoon, heaven help you, or you know, four o'clock at night or even six, those are still going to be so hot from all of your uh, from all of that day being in the sun. So that's cooling that down will be important. We can soak it in some things in ice water. You can you can dunk it in ice water right there. You wouldn't want to leave it, no. so I wouldn't really say soak, but absolutely you can dunk it in ice water. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about seed storage. Okay, obviously you wanna keep them labeled, but it's so important to store them in a cool, dry place where it's protected from insects. Um, seed storage life can really vary in a huge, huge way. Okay, there are some things where the seeds are really short-lived and they're known to be that way. Corn, onions, parsley, parsnips, peppers. Okay, so you wouldn't wanna store, you know, try to store something for five years, a pepper that you really love, you would try to, you would want to try to grow that every year or every other year to keep your seed fresh, okay? Um, there are some things that are intermediate keepers, beans, broccoli, asparagus, carrots, peas, spinach. Um, so they can keep for a few years, but again, this is at peak, you know, Peak keeping dryness is a huge deal. Um, if you're one of those folks that carries your seeds in your car, uh, they're gonna be very bad, um, very bad return on that because the heat from the car will kill the seeds, okay? There are some seeds that are really long lived, beets, chards, cabbage, turnips, radishes, eggplants, your lettuces, um, pumpkin and squash. Um, I, I found some seed from 1993, okay, and it was for um, bushel gourds, and knowing that those seeds are long-lived, I still, I tried. I put them out to see if they would grow, because it's possible that they might have. So, for, but now the reason there have been squash and other things grown literally from tombs um, and cave findings where they were sealed in a container. Um, and so as long as you have that dryness, there's lack of moisture, you have that potential for long-term seed saving. But the ones that they find and do that with are generally squash and stuff like that are from the cabbage family. Uh, those really long-lived things. Did you have a question? Yes. What if you store them in the freezer? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, okay. You can store them in the freezer or you can store them in the refrigerator. You can put them in a mason jar, you know, but you want to put something in there that's going to absorb that. And I love this, this recipe for that. You can actually do a small cloth bag with like um, powdered milk in the bottom, underneath, in the bottom of the mason jar, and then put the seed packets on top of that, screw the lid on it. Um, so you can do that. Um, okay, would you double, double your recommended years uh, shortly? Of one not necessarily. <clears throat> it would, you know, it totally depends on the seed and the quality and all of that. So, this is best practices, you know, unless it's in a hermetically sealed vault, you know, and even then there's some viability for that. So, but it definitely can add time to that. Definitely. Um, Seems like if you're gonna, if you're, you know, just trying to think of the family trying to save seeds, they're, 
dedicate a certain amount of space. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, most most people that are doing um, you know open pollinated seed storage would have a chest freezer or something like that dedicated to uh, to that. And but you can absolutely still lose viability in a freezer. That's right. Those things need to be brought out and grown out so that uh, you can continue sort of that pattern. So it's not an indefinite thing. Okay. So the first link on this is our easy gardening series. Most of you guys have probably already seen that before. I recommend following that link. You can Google Aggie Horticulture and that when it brings up that page, it's going to be under your vegetable resources. Um, and that's the easy gardening series. And that's just, um, it's kind of a crop by crop. Here's the easiest way to garden this. Um, and then this next link, I'm going to put it in the conversation because this is our, um, that is the link to our survey, the quick little survey that I want you guys to do, please and thank you. Um, it should take like a maximum of like a minute and a half or something um, to do it. So I'd just appreciate you guys popping in there to do the survey right quick. And, uh, Where, do we have to go to the, what website to do that? Um, the website? It's, yeah, the it's a... Qualtrics website. Um, if you were here in person, it would be a paper copy. But for you guys online, the best I can do is a uh, um, connection to um, to the survey form online. So we be sending an email to click on or what? No, I put it in the. Con can you see the chat box? Yes. Or, so the link I just posted that link in the chat oh. box. It's the very last comment. Yeah, I just saw it. Um, oops. So um, if you want to do that, this is y'all's opportunity to ask me questions. Um, if y'all had a question about anything we had going on there, um, you said there was a download for this whole um, presentation in the yes. chat. Well, the not the visual part of this, but for the PDF um, right. of my PowerPoint, you bet. And hang Where? on just a second. I'm gonna put. I've already done it in the chat once, and I'm about to do it again. So, hang on okay. just a second. Okay. So there's the Qualtrics link to take, and here is the link to the um, presentation that Google Docs presentation. Normally I do it as a PDF and today I just got in a hurry and it's still my PowerPoint, but same, same. Um, okay. Thank you. The PDF would have been a smaller download for y'all, but uh, anyway, hopefully you guys had the opportunity to uh, learn something you might not have known about storage or uh, some, some thought you might have had that uh, you know maybe it just piqued your your interest for something you could do differently in your own home program. Mm -hmm. This is the best. This is the best one so far. Hey, that's cool. Opinion. I like hearing that. So many things. That's that, cool. Uh, that's that's the whole purpose, right? Yeah. So um, definitely, um, you would. Uh, if there's a spot on there to make a comment for something else you want to learn about or, you know, you really hate me and think I'm a horrible teacher or whatever you might like to say about that, but feel free to put comments on there. Um, if the Zoom works for you or you don't like it or there's something, you know, you think we could improve on, that would be great. Uh, Vicki, which topic, which presentation on herbs? The, thank you. Um, can you tell me which presentation you're talking about? Was it last month's where I was doing pollination? Um, so um, you can let me know if you want to let me know in an email, Vic, what uh, 
Oh, I just did an hour long online class a couple of weeks ago. Oh, 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 oh. So that I'm like, oh yeah, that video. Oh yeah. So um, the presentation for that, you can, so the video should be available on YouTube now, and it's certainly available on the, the Aggie Horticulture Facebook site. Um, the, the PowerPoint pages that I did on the end, I haven't, um, uh, you know, um, I haven't put that because it wasn't a complete PowerPoint. It was just notes at the end of that. So I recommend just pausing that video and taking notes on that. Let me know if you have trouble finding the video and I'll make sure to get it to you. Um, yes, people have put out red Christmas, Christmas balls to try to trick the birds. It does not work. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so that's what she said. That Patty says now she picks them at color break. It's a great idea, uh, but those birds, they know. <laughs> they can smell those tomatoes the same as we can. <laughs> anyway, but uh, I love, you know, I love that as a as an idea, you know, people, lots of people have tried that, but it just has not always worked. I just wanted to make sure my links, did everybody get those links I put out? I wanted to make sure they went out to everybody, but it's hard for me to scroll through my chat. So anyway, any more questions for me? No? Y'all are quiet as church mice tonight, which, you know, is all good. <laughs> it's upside down. Yeah. You're, you're muted forever now. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> we'll have to see what we can do to fix that. Your Vicky must be the one in charge of that. No, I'm sure Craig Caldwell had a vote in that. <laughs> cookie, Jen. Uh, uh, I'd like to eat a cookie. Anyway, thanks so much, you guys. I really appreciate you spending Thank you. some time with me tonight. And uh, so that's all good. I hope uh, everybody's had a good time and learned some things. And I hope I haven't, uh, anyway, muted anybody that can't unmute themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all have a good night. Uh, I really okay, appreciate no. you guys and your time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you, You're welcome, Brenda. Bye-bye. You guys have a good night. <laughs>